One day he came upon deck and taking his arm as he had, had been my want. I sauntered him, with him backward and forward. His gloom, however, which I considered quite natural under the circumstances, seemed entirely unabated. He said little in that moodily and with evident effort I ventured a jest or two, and he made a sickening attempt at a smile. Poor fellow. As I thought of his wife, I wondered that he could have heart to put on even the semblance of mirth. At last I ventured a home thrust. I determined to commence a series of covert insinuations or innuendos about the oblong box, just to let him perceive gradually that I was not altogether the butt or victim of a little bit of pleasant mystification. My first observation was by way of opening a masked battery. I said something about the peculiar shape of that box as I spoke the words. I smiled knowingly, winked, and touched him gently with my forefinger at the ribs. The manner in which Wyatt received this harmless pleasantry convinced me at once that he was mad. At first he stared at me as if he found it impossible to comprehend the witticism of my remark, but as his point seemed slowly to make its way into his brain, his eyes in the same pro pro proportion seemed protruding from their sockets. Then it grew very red, then hideously pale, then as if highly amused by with what I had insinuated, he began a loud and boisterous laugh, which to my astonishment he kept up with gradually increasing vigor for ten minutes or more. In conclusion, he fell flat and heavily upon the deck. When I ran to uplift him, to all appearance he was dead. I called assistance, and with much difficulty we brought him to himself. Upon reviving, he spoke incoherently for some time. At length, we bled him and put him to bed. The next morning he was quite recovered. So far as regarded his mere bodily health, of his mind I say nothing, of course. I avoided him during the rest of the passage by advice of the captain, who seemed to coincide with me altogether on my views of his insanity, but cautioned me to say nothing on this head to any person on board. Several circumstances occurred immediately after this fit of Wyatt's, which contributed to heighten the curiosity with which I had already possessed. Among other things, this I have been nervous to drink too much, too much strong green tea, and slept in the ill at night. In fact, for two nights I could not be probably said to have slept at all. Now my stateroom opened with the main cabin, or dining room, as did those of the single men on board. Wife's three rooms were in the altar cabin in the after cabin which was separated from the, the main one by a slight sliding door never locked even at night since we were almost constantly on a wind and the breeze was not a little stiff the ship heeled to leeward very considerably and whenever her starboard side was to leeward the side door between the cabins slid open, and so remained, nobody taking the trouble to get up and shut it. But my berth was to such a position that when my own stateroom door was open, as well as the sliding door in question, 
and my own door was always open on account of this heat. I could see you know, the after cabin quite distinctly and just at that the portion of the two where were situated the staterooms of Mr. Wyatt. Well, dur during two nights, not consecutive, while I lay awake, I clearly saw Mrs. W. about 11 o'clock upon each night steal cautiously from the stateroom of Mr. W. and enter the extra room, where she remained until daybreak. When she was called to by her husband and went back, that they were virtually separated was clear. They had separate apartments, no doubt in contemplation of a more permanent divorce. And here, after all, I thought was the mystery of the extra stateroom. There was another circumstance, too, which interested me much. During the two wakeful nights in question, I immediately after the disappearance of Mrs. Wyatt in the extra stateroom, I was attracted by a certain singular, cautious, subdued noises in that of her husband. After listening to them for some time with thoughtful attention, I at length succeeded perfectly in translating their import. There were sounds occasioned by the artist in prying open the oblong box by means of a chisel and mallet. The latter being apparently muffled or deadened by some woolen or cotton substance in which the head was enveloped. In this matter, I fancied I could distinguish the precise moment when he fairly disengaged the lid also that I could determine when he removed it altogether, and when he deposited it upon the lower berth in his room, this latter point I knew, for example, by certain slight taps when the lid was made in striking against the wood edges of the berth, as he endeavored to lay it down very gently, there being no room for it on the floor. After this, there was a dead stillness, and I heard nothing more. Upon either occasion, until nearly daybreak, unless perhaps I mentioned a low sobbing or murmuring sound, so very much suppressed it as to be nearly inaudible, if indeed the whole of this latter noise were not rather produced by my own imagination. I say it seemed to resemble a sombre or sighing, but of course it could not have been either. I rather think it was the ringing in my own ears. Mr. White, no doubt, according to the custom, was merely given the rein to one of his hobbies, indulging in one of his fits of artistic enthusiasm. He opened his oblong box in order to feast his eyes on the pictorial treasure within. There was nothing in this, however, to make him sob. I repeat, therefore, that it must have been simply a freak of my own fancy. Distempered by good Captain Hardy's cream tea, just before dawn, on each of the two nights in which I speak, I distinctly heard Mr. Wyatt replace the lid upon the oblong box and force the nails into their old places by means of the, old, the muffled mallet. Having done this, he were issue, issued from his stateroom, fully dressed, and proceeded to call Mrs. W. from hers. We had been at sea seven days and were now off Cape Hatteras, when there came a tremendously heavy blow from the southern southwest. We were, in a measure, prepared for it. However, as the weather had been holding out threats for some time, 
Everything was made snug, a lout and a loft. A low and a loft. And as the wind steadily freshened, we lay to at length under spanker and fore topsail, both double reefed. In this trim, we rode safely enough for 48 hours, the ship proving herself an excellent sea boat in many respects, and shipping no water of any consequence. At the end of this period, however, the gale had freshened into a hurricane, and our after sail split into ribbons, bringing us so much into the trough of the water that we shipped several prodigious seas, one immediately after the other. By this accident, we lost three men overboard with the caboose, and nearly the whole of the larboard bulwarks. Scarcely we had recovered Have we recovered our senses before the foretop sail went to the Tritus? When we got up a storm stay sail, and with this did pretty well for some hours, the ship heading the sea much more steadily than before. The gale still went on, however, and we saw no signs of it abating. The rigging was found to be ill-fitted and greatly strained. And on the third day of the blow, about five in the afternoon, our mizzen mast and a heavy lurch to the windward went by the board. For an hour or more, we tried in vain to get rid of it on account of the prodigious rolling of the ship. And before we had succeeded, the carpenter came aft and announced four feet of water in the hold. To add to our dilemma, we found the pumps choked and nearly useless. All was now confusion and despair, but an effort was made to lighten the ship by throwing overboard as much of her cargo as could be reached, and by cutting away the two masts that remained. This we at last accomplished, but we were still unable to do anything in the pumps. In the meantime, the leak gained on us very fast. At sundown, the gale had sensibly diminished in violence, and as the sea went down with it, we still entertained faint hopes of saving ourselves in the boats. At 8 p.m., the clouds broke away to windward, and we had the advantage of a full moon. A piece of good fortune would serve wonderfully to cheer our drooping spirits. After immediate incredible labor, we succeeded at length in getting the longboat over the side without material accident. And into this we crowded the whole of the crew and most of the passengers. This party made off immediately, and after undergoing much suffering, finally arrived in safety. At Ocracoke Inlet, in the third day of the, after the wreck. Fourteen passengers with the captain remained on board, resolving to trust their fortunes to the jolly boat at the stern. We lowered it without difficulty, although it was only by a miracle that we prevented it from swamping it as it touched the water. It contained, when afloat, the captain and his wife, Mr. White and the party, a Mexican officer, wife, four children, myself, with a Negro valet. We had no room, of course, for anything except a few positively necessary instruments, some provisions, and the clothes upon our backs. No one had even thought of attempting to save anything more. What must have been at the astonishment of all of them when, having proceeded a few fathoms in front of the ship, Mr. White stood up in the stern sheets and coolly demanded of Captain Hardy that the boat should be put back for the purpose of taking his up on box. Sit down, Mr. Wyatt, replied the captain, somewhat sternly. You will capsize us if you, all, if you do not sit so quite still. Our gunwale is almost in the water now. The box, vociferated Mr. Wyatt, still standing. The box, I say, 
Captain Hardy, you cannot, you will not refuse me. Its weight will be but a trifle. It is nothing, mere nothing. But the mother who bore you, for the love of heaven, by your hope of salvation, I implore you to put back for the box. The captain, for a moment, seemed touched by the earnest appeal of the artist, but he regained his stern composure and merely said, Mr. White, you are mad. I cannot listen to you. Sit down, I say, or you will swamp the boat. Stay, hold him, seize him. He is about to spring overboard. There, I knew it. He is over. As the captain said this, Mr. Wyatt, in fact, sprang from the boat, and as we were yet in the lee of the wreck, succeeded by almost superhuman exertion in getting hold of a rope which hung from the four chains. In another moment, he was on board and rushing frantically down to the cabin. In the meantime, we had swept astern of the ship and bringing quite out of her lee, were at the mercy of the tremendous sea which was still running. We made a, a determined effort to put back, but our little boat was like a feather in a breath of a tempest. We saw at a glance that the doom of the unfortunate artist was sealed. As our distance from the wreck rapidly increased, the madman, for such only we could regard him, was seen to emerge from the companionway, of which by dint of strength that appeared gigantic, he dragged bodily the oblong box. When we had gazed to the, in the extremity of astonishment, he passed rapidly several turns at a three-inch rope, first around the box and then around his body. By another instant, both body and box were in the sea, disappearing suddenly once and forever. We lingered a while and sadly upon our oars, with our eyes riveted upon the spot. At length we pulled away. The silence remained unbroken for an hour. Finally, I hazarded a remark. Did you observe, Captain, how suddenly they sank? Was not that an exceedingly singular thing? I confess that I entertained some feeble hope of his final deliverance when I saw him lash himself to the box and commit himself to the sea. They sank as a matter of course, replied the captain, and that like a shot. They will soon rise again, however, but not till the salt melts. The salt, I ejaculated. Hush, said the captain, pointing to his wife and the sisters of the deceased. We must talk of these things as a more appropriate time. We suffered much and made a narrow escape, but fortune refrained us as well as our mates to the longboat. We landed and find more dead than alive. After four days of intense distress upon the beach opposite Roanoke Island, we remained here a week, were not ill treated by the wreckers and at length obtained a passage to New York. About a month after the loss of the independence, I happened to meet the Captain Hardy in the Broadway. Our conversation turned, naturally, upon the disaster and especially upon the sad fate of poor Wyatt. I thus learned the following particulars. The artist engaged passage book for himself, wife, two sisters, and a servant. His wife, indeed, was as she had been mis as she had been represented, the most lovely and most accomplished woman. On the morning of the fourteenth of June, the day in which I first visited the ship, the lady suddenly sickened and died. The young husband was frantic with grief, but circumstances imp imperatively forbade the deferring of his voyage to New York. It was necessary to take it to his mother the corpse of his adored wife, and on the other's hand, 
The universal prejudice which would prevent his doing so openly was well known. Nine-tenths of the passengers would have abandoned the ship rather than take passage with a dead body. In this dilemma, Captain Hardy arranged that a corpse, being first partially embalmed and packed with a large quantity of salt in a box with suitable dimensions, should be conveyed on board as merchandise. Nothing was to be said of the lady's deceased, and it was well understood that Mr. Wyatt had engaged Passover's wife. It became necessary that some person should pers personate her during the voyage. This the deceased lady's maid was easily prevailed on to do. The extra stateroom occasionally originally engaged for this girl during her mistress's life was now merely retained. In the stateroom, the pseudo wife slept, of course, every night. In the daytime, she performed, to the best of her ability, the part of her mistress, whose person, it had been carefully ascertained, was unknown to any of the part passengers on board. My own mistake arose, naturally enough, through too careless, too inquisitive, too, and too impulsive a temperament. But of late, it is a rare thing that I sleep soundly at night. There is a countenance which haunts me, turn as I will. There is a hysterical laugh which will forever ring within my ears.